It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Now, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting if you just email me directly at OppermanInvestigations at gmail.com. Uh, we got today a, a fellow named Jeff Ignatowski. He's written this book, just ink's not even dry yet. Beyond the Headlines, True Crimes, Myths, and Legends. And he was telling me how this is just volume one of this book, okay? Uh, it's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff about the, the, the myths and legends behind these famous uh, cases. Uh, but the next one's going to be about criminal cases and then uh, cults and religion. So right up our alley here. Now, he's also got this card game he wrote. He not wrote, uh, but designed or invented, I guess you might say, right? The killer's uh, card game, 18 plus for the lovers of all things true crime. You can find him on Twitter, Instagram, uh, mostly Facebook. He's got a YouTube that he puts out new content every week called Five Minute Murder. Uh, Mr. Jeff Ignatowski, are you there? I'm here. Hey, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Uh, tell us about yourself. Who is Jeff, Jeff Ignatowski? Man, I'll tell you, that is a, a loaded yeah. question. <laughs> Take it easier I after have, this one. Uh, <laughs> you know, I I'm uh, it, I just turned 44 years old, uh, so that is uh, that is a thing now. So I've gotten to experience uh, a lot of things, man. It's it. You know, <laughs> when I was a kid, I always thought that you know I always wanted to be older. I wanted to be yeah. you know already experienced all these things. And now that I'm there, uh, I'm not so sure that I. I I wish I would have thought something else when I was younger. But, uh, yeah, I'm originally from the East Coast. I grew up right outside of Philadelphia. Uh, I actually grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, have always been fascinated with true crime. It's been uh, in and around me for as long as I can remember and uh, have always been fascinated with gaming. Uh, so I started really early when I was in high school uh, playing Dungeons and & Dragons and Magic the Gathering. And so it's kind of just evolved into something that's been part of my life. Uh, and then I got into really designing things. And uh, as I got into the whole true crime space, then everybody was like, you know, Jeff, you should actually write a book. And I was like, hey, I've tried to write three books, and none of them have been successful. None of them have gotten anywhere beyond, you know, maybe writing a chapter or two, and then I just got bored with it. Uh, and then for whatever reason, um, I started writing this true crime book, and it just all kind of flowed. And within three weeks, I was done. You know, I got to chapter five, and I think I was like 30, 35,000 words in, and I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to – uh, change up the plans because it was supposed to be one book with three parts. And so once I got to 35,000 words in the first volume, I was like, okay, we're going to have to split this up and we're going to have to do three books because I don't want to do an 800 page tome. Mm. But yeah, I've been uh, around all over. You know, I, I moved from the East Coast, moved continually moving progressively west and have kind of landed in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. Uh, love it here and have been, uh, you know, just doing the thing. And I seem to get all over. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about these 12 years you did with the, the juvenile department of corrections as a corrections officer? Yeah, I, I worked for the Department of Juvenile Justice for a long time. Before that, I worked for a children's home. I was a counselor there working with kids for a long time. Uh, and then I moved on to the Department of Juvenile Justice, which was uh, a state-run organization uh, working for the state of Kentucky. And I got to work in a pilot program there where I was working with children and families and helping them reintegrate into society after coming back from being in, you know, detention centers and youth development camps and stuff. And so I would help them get back in. I'd help them get jobs. I'd help them go to school. Uh, do different programs, you know, uh, whatever drug counseling and stuff like that that they needed to go to. Uh, I would help facilitate a lot of that stuff. Uh, so we got to work really, really closely with the families and the children. And uh, it was a really unique program. Uh, sadly, uh, the state of Kentucky phased that program out. Uh, before we left that program, though, I worked with uh, the SMART team in Kentucky, which meant that I went to um, I would go to Frankfurt once a month 
and work with everybody in the Department of Juvenile Justice trying to do planning and stuff for the department as a whole, which was kind of neat. I got to go down there and meet with the directors and stuff and got to put my input in uh, in different programs and how I thought that we could better serve the kids and the families that we were working with. So I got to really get kind of behind the scenes in a lot of that. Uh, in addition to that, it gave me a lot of my early uh, psychological training uh, and working with families and understanding some of the things that I had already experienced myself because uh, I come from uh, – you know, I come from the street and uh, I come from an abusive household. Uh, I struggled with a lot of that stuff growing up. So, you know, I understood where the kids were already, but I didn't really have the tools to really help. Right. I, I, I understood them from a personal perspective, but I needed to gain the tools to understand how to help them and how to deal with some of the issues that they were facing. And so I got a lot of that working with the state, which was awesome. Did you see any success stories like your own uh, with these young kids? Because when I, I, I see these cases all the time, working as a criminal defense investigator, uh, you, you meet these people, they had no chance in life, you know, from the very start. Their parents were a mess, there were no education, abuse, addictions. Did you see success stories like your own? Uh, there are some. Yeah. Uh, and I think there are always some. Uh, I think a lot of times they're few and far and in between uh, because – there are a lot of gaps in the system, right? Um, you know, there's a <laughs> there there are a lot of things out there, and uh, you know, I, I'm kind of old school when it comes to some of that. And I think that there is a, a place for discipline, and I think that often when we let people skate by, and we give and give and give, and we don't allow them to face the consequences of the things that they do, mm. I think they miss out on a lot. And so when I was working, uh, specifically when I was working at the children's home, I was one of the stronger disciplinarians there. Uh, I did not let people get away with stuff. Uh, same thing when I worked as a corrections officer. You know, I've always been somebody that you could talk to. But you also had to know that if I said this needed to be done, it needed to be done. Uh, and I think teaching people that goes a long way because I think we miss out sometimes, uh, especially with our kids. Like I have I have a son and, you know, I think we forget that they have to learn real world skills. And when we miss out on that and we hold our children back from learning those things and learning sometimes those tough lessons, uh, that really teach us and shape us and grow us, we miss out and we end up handicapped to deal with life uh, as it is because life is not easy. Uh, it's difficult. And if we're able to help some of those kids uh, learn that there are ways that they can find things and they can find success without having to turn to drugs or violence or gangs or whatever, uh, that there is an alternative to that. Uh, then I think you find success uh, as long as they understand that. And, you know, I've done a lot of stuff with like Tony Robbins and stuff like that. And I understand that people change one of two ways. It, it's either through uh, maximum pain and we get to a place where we're like, hey, we don't want to touch the stove anymore because we know it burns. Uh, so we don't do that anymore. Or through maximum pleasure, right? You get to a place where something is so incredible. You just can't turn away from that. You have to do that. And I think it's either one of those two things. If we could show people that uh, and really give that to them, I think that that changes the paradigm for them. And there can be success, but often, you know, because of circumstances, because of people that they're around, because their family is the way that it is, uh, it makes it very, very hard for them once they get back out into the regular world to be able to find that success and to be able to maintain it. Yeah, and, and when you say discipline, it doesn't always have to mean punishment. Like I noticed here, you're involved with the Spartan program. And it's like, a, I guess, some kind of multi-country race or, or thing. That <laughs> discipline that, that you do when you're out there hiking and you know, I used to swim three miles. I was a triathlete. You know, I swim three miles for hours. You don't have the discipline, that discipline, that um, dedication, that uh, one foot in front of the other hiking for eight, 10, 12 hours. You know? like, so tell us about this Spartan thing you do. 
Yeah, so I used to do all of the very, very long multi-day endurance events with Spartan Race. I've run all of their events. I was actually, uh, a couple years ago, there was a, a program that Spartan did called the Delta, right? It was a uh, it was, it's actually a pyramid. I have one downstairs. I was actually Delta number 12 and it was the 12th person in the world to finish every single piece of their programming. Uh, that's not just races. It was also curriculum that we had to go through. Uh, it was modules that we had to do, uh, that were all based on, you know, life and, and how you deal with life and deal with adversity. And, um, Joe DeSena is the one that runs Spartan race, uh, incredible, incredible guy. He definitely knows how to push your buttons and uh, put you in the most miserable situations just to see how you'll react and if you'll overcome or if you'll fold and go home. And so at one time I was, uh, I'm not anymore, but at one time I was the leading athlete in the world doing those long endurance events. And uh, it was incredible. I went to Scotland. I went to Beijing. I did stuff on the Great Wall. I've been to Vermont a bunch of times in the Green Mountains doing events. And, you know, I went and I paid for people uh, to, to beat me down so that I could find where my limits were. And I could figure out, okay, this is as far as I can push. And what I found doing all of that stuff, you know, being someone who has already overcome a lot. Uh, but, you know, even though you – may have suffered trauma and ha be a very resilient person, it doesn't mean that you, you figured out how to focus that. And I think that that's what Spartan Race did for me. It helped me really focus the trauma that I had already had, uh, pushing myself through those really, really difficult situations. You know, we would carry 60, 70 pound packs, you know, with, uh, you know, carrying a kayak filled with water and, you know, sometimes they'd make us do 3,000 burpees and, you know, all kinds of crazy physical labor uh, to make it to the end of this event, if you could make it. And, you know, the first couple events that we did, they had a bell there that you could ring out at any time and go home. And, you know, I did that once. And uh, I was at a winter event a couple years ago. And I didn't realize how much I hated the cold until I went into Vermont and it was negative 14 degrees and two feet of snow on the ground. And I realized that I could not handle it. Like it broke me mentally. And, you know, I ended up tapping out after about 30 hours. But uh, after 11 hours, I was completely out of my mind. And I hung around for another 19 hours trying to figure it out. But I, I could never recover. And, um, uh, uh, I've always wanted to go back and do that winter event again because uh, I feel like I got a score to settle. <laughs> now, if we go to your Twitter and look at your link tree, where would we find you talking about that Spartan stuff? Or YouTube, anything like that? Uh, so, if you look at uh, YouTube, there's a couple uh, documentaries. Uh, they're entitled Agogi. It's A G O G E. And there's one on the Great Wall. And several of those documentaries, especially the early ones, I'm in. Um, maybe not as a speaker necessarily, but as a uh, – uh, you'll see me in the background, especially the China one. Uh, it's called The Endless Wall. Hmm. And uh, that one, I'm in there a bunch. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't really talked about all the Spartan stuff in a while. I used to write articles. Uh, I've been published in several magazines uh, for the stuff that I did with Spartan Race. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we kind of uh, – I got involved in all the true crime stuff, yeah, and yeah. that is uh, – people haven't asked me about that in a long time. It's kind of cool. I'm, uh, I'm glad you asked me. <laughs> oh, no, I'd love to have you come back just to talk about that. But if you want to meet uh, Mr. Ignatowski in person, you go to the Lion's Tooth Friday, October 11th at 5.30 p.m. And check him out. You're going to ask him about Spartan. <laughs> but when you came here to talk about this book, Beyond the Headlines, True Crimes, Myths, and Legends, what are we going to find in this book? So uh, in the book, the, the first volume there, we cover 10 different uh, serial killers. And, it, and it's funny because one of them is not a serial killer. And uh, one of them uh, hasn't even been – was never convicted of the crime. Uh, but, that, of course, that's Lizzie Borden. Uh, but we go through 10 different killers in there. Um, and we talk about – the, the original idea of the book came from this idea uh, 
Do you remember that show, Two Truths and a Lie? Yes. There, there used to be a show, yeah. Uh, it's an older show, but when I started writing, that's kind of what popped into my head because I was talking about really myths and legends. So it's something that could be true, may not be true, may have some basis in fact, may not. And so uh, the idea came, I was like, dude, I want to do three myths and a legend. And so that ended up being the structure for the book. And we go through each one of those different killers. Uh, I give a brief history of who they were, where they grew up, you know, what brought them to the place where they uh, became this killer, uh, what, what transpired through those events. And then I go into the three different myths and uh, we'll talk about, uh, like, for example, Lizzie Borden, uh, one of them, you know, was was she considered did, did her parents find out that she was a lesbian? Is that and is that why she killed them? So, uh, you know, of course, Lizzie, we don't know if she did it or not. She was actually acquitted of the crime. Um, Elizabeth Bathory is in there. She's actually chapter one. And one of the myths in there is, did she actually kill, you know, 600 virgins? Uh, because that is the, the story, right? She no, I never heard this story. Wait, who is Elizabeth Bathory? Tell yeah. us that story. I never heard uh, this Elizabeth one. Bathory, yeah. yeah, she was way, way back, uh, back in the times of Vlad the Impaler and okay. everything uh, over in uh, Europe. But she was kind of almost in the same region, actually. I, I talk a little bit about Vlad the Impaler and the ideas around Dracula. And if it was inspired by Vlad the Impaler or maybe uh, some from the Elizabeth Bathory story. But anyway, Elizabeth Bathory around that same time uh, was a um, – uh, I'm trying to think. She was a countess. There we go. And she had a bunch of handmaidens, her husband – uh, who she married was a particularly weird guy, uh, as many of those uh, those nobles and stuff were back then. Uh, got her involved in a lot of really really uh, seedy things, and built dungeons and torture chambers for her uh, in all of their castles. And then when he passed away, she kind of went off the rails and started torturing people, torturing her own handmaidens. There is a bunch of stories uh, about her bathing in blood, uh, killing her handmaidens, and, uh, of course, this long, long story that people say that she, you know, put the blood on her face, she noticed that she looked younger, and so she started bathing in the blood to be younger. Uh, she eventually ends up getting, uh, getting caught for all of this stuff, uh, they do convict her of murder, and they basically uh, they take everything from her. And uh, they say the one of the legends is, is that they walled her up in her own castle, and she spent the rest of her days there. Uh, I think she only lived a, a year or two after that, uh, and then she died herself. But uh, but it is a wild, wild story. Uh, lots and lots of talk about vampirism and all of that around Elizabeth Bathory. There's several movies about her. Uh, the Blood Countess, uh, I think, was both a movie and a book that were directly about Elizabeth Bathory. Uh, but she is also gets the moniker of the first known serial killer. So, uh, so I had to add her at the very first chapter of the book. Uh, then I go through uh, Jack the Ripper, H.H. H. Holmes. Uh, we cover Gacy. Uh, Bundy. Okay, what are the myths uh, been, uh, the myth about the Gacy? Uh, so uh, there are a bunch of different myths about Gacy. Uh, Gacy is fascinating. Uh, I actually I was surprised that when I wrote the book <laughs> uh, that I ended up. I, I've always been a huge, huge fan of H.H. Holmes. Uh, I've loved that story for a long time. It's one of my favorites. Uh, but when I started writing the book, I, I got really, really dove in at Gacy for whatever reason. So one of the myths that we cover in here is that his house smelled bad. Hmm. So we know that Gacy murdered uh, potentially 33 young men. Uh, 27 of them were stuffed in the crawl space buried under his house. Uh, there were four that were thrown in the river, and then there were a couple that were – there was one underneath of his, like, patio where his grill was and everything. I think one in the garage. So um, anyway, 
there has always been this myth that his house smelled bad. And so there is some some story behind that where his wife at the time that was living there uh, made a comment to, to John and said, hey, what is that smell? And he said, you know, something must have died under the house. I'll take care of it. And that's when he starts dumping the, the lime in the basement or the, yeah, the lime. And so he starts putting that down in the crawl space there. And apparently that takes care of the smell. Now, he had dinner parties at his house. He had all kinds of people over there all the time. He was a pretty well-known guy in Chicago. Nobody ever complained about a smell. Now, later on, of course, the, the myth is is that the police went there. They went and talked to him. Uh, one of the cops went into the bathroom to use the restroom. The vent kicked on, and he smelled what smelled like decaying bodies. Mm. Now, I know several people, and probably one of the reasons why I'm so close to this case is that I know several people that are directly involved with it now. Uh, I know um, – uh, oh, man – I don't know why I always forget his last name. Uh, uh, Bill. Bill Dorsch. Bill Dorsch. Yep, he's been on my show yeah, several Bill times. Bill Dorsch, yeah. of course. Yeah, Bill is a great guy. Uh, he is a former detective, uh, police whistleblower, right? And so he knew Gacy. Uh, he also knew all of the people that were involved in that case. And uh, so I asked him, I said, you know, who was the the officer that said that he smelled the smell in Gacy's house? And he gave me like the full report on all of that stuff. It turns out that that report was never submitted until over a week later. And uh, it was never discussed the night that it happened. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in the car with my, uh, with my partner and I came out of a house, I think I would have probably mentioned it right then. Like, dude, did you smell that? smelled terrible in there and it was never mentioned until after they arrested gacy which means that it probably didn't happen that night so anyway that is one of the myths in there that i talk about around the gacy uh story but he is fascinating i'm i'm friends with uh uh, bob mata jr uh who does defense diaries podcast and you know his dad was bob mata senior who was gacy one of gacy's defense attorneys so, yeah, I, I kind of got wrapped up in that case a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I've had Dorsch on the show about four hours. We've had him on four times. He's often like uh, hungry or something like that. He retired some strange place. He, uh, you, you know, he, and, He's in Greece right now. There you go, Greece, yeah, wherever it is. Yeah, And what do you call it? He's got this great uh, work he's done. There was another location where uh, Gacy would do landscaping, and he's convinced there's more bodies yeah. over there. The ground-penetrating radar. I got the letter <laughs> from the company that was doing this ground penetrating radar where they said well yeah the cops wouldn't let us dig where we found the bodies so there's there's more bodies out there with casey they are currently working on going back and digging at those sites i say let's go in the middle of the night and do it (laughs) just go there and do it (laughs) but we got the tasky now the guy's fit as a fiddle over here he can dig for hours right (laughs) i keep telling i keep telling bob and bill i keep saying hey uh, I'm, I'm, just call me when you guys are going. I'll bring yeah. a shovel. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, you can dig for hours, right? What about Ted Bundy? What do you got on Ted Bundy? What myths did you find there? So there, there's a bunch of things uh, about Bundy, and and it's interesting. Uh, when I did the one of the people that did the did the editing on the book that went over it uh, was Kevin Sullivan. Okay, uh, Kevin has written a ton of books about Bundy specifically. He is probably one of the number one Bundy experts out there. Uh, the guy has been really close with the family and, you know, really gotten involved in all of that stuff. So it was kind of cool to have like the Bundy expert reading my book. Um, uh, the girl who wrote the forward to my book is also a Bundy expert, uh, EJ Hammond, uh, who is a good friend of mine. And uh, consequently, for all of you that don't know this yet, uh, me and EJ are currently working on a book together, and we just had a conversation today about uh, sketching some of that out. And uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to release this or not, but uh, we are going to be focusing on the childhood of a lot of these different killers, and we'll be really deep diving into uh, what may or may not have created these monsters. 
So, um, so it should be fascinating when we're done with that. Uh, we've got a few other people that we're talking to to try to get on board so that we can do some real, real interesting criminal analysis uh, on these different killers. But, yeah, that is, uh, that is uh, to come, and we're working on that together. But, uh, but yeah, Bundy, uh, Kevin looked through it, and it was funny because there were several things he was like, hey, uh, you need to change this and tweak that. Uh, really, really small things. Uh, like, for example, I mentioned in the book that when Bundy uh, escaped in Denver, I believe, but anyway, when he escaped and was in the mountains there, that he had circled a couple different places on a map that he had. And uh, uh, Kevin told me that that was incorrect, that there was only one place that was circled on that map. Uh, there, It was just one, and there was only one map. Uh, I, I think I mentioned that there may have been a map to a school as well, and he said no, there was not that. So it was really interesting, but that's from somebody who like was right there, has all of the case files, and can look at all of that stuff uh, directly from the source. So it was really cool to kind of get his uh, his approval and his uh, his background uh, as an influence into that. But one of the things that I talk about is Bundy's childhood in there a little bit. Uh, and that whether, you know, there's this this idea that he came from a good Christian household. And so I think that there are a lot of things in his childhood that are very, very sketchy. He struggled with a lot of things, whether, excuse me, it was the family or if it was just Bundy himself. Uh, Bundy had some very, very strange things, like he would dig pits and put, like, sticks in them and then try to get his friends to fall in the pits uh, so that he could uh, hurt them, right? He did that to several of his friends when he was, a, when he was really young. Uh, and, you know, just something that, you know, usually kids are out there building forts and stuff and, you know, hanging out and going in the woods together. Not uh, anymore, this guy man. Was building pits. <laughs> They're all on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That, that's true. They're, they're, they're all playing video games yeah. and online. Yeah. Uh, it is a, a very, very different landscape than than when we were kids, you know? Well, I'm 20 years older than you, yeah. <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah. But, but still, yeah, it's a whole a whole new world, man. Yeah. Wasn't he like a peeping Tom, too, as a kid? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I believe, I want to say that that started around like 12, 14 years old. Uh, there's another thing that I cover in there, too there is the possibility that he started killing when he was younger yeah. too. There was a girl in town uh, when I, I believe it was 12 or 14 uh, when he had his paper route uh, that a girl went and disappeared and they never have found her body. Uh, they've never found her. And she was very close to the paper route that Ted had. So there's a possibility that he saw her and abducted her and who knows what he did. Uh, from there, but that was one of the things uh, that EJ had brought to my attention, and so we included that in the book too. Um, yeah, crazy, crazy. Yeah, what about you know Bundy too? You know he had these political connections, and, and in one of his interviews, he's talking about how some serial killers have their own crematorium and they have access to a, a crematorium. Uh, find anything new on that kind of stuff? Uh, you know, he is an interesting character because yeah. him. Uh, just like Gacy, too. Yeah. Uh, of course, Gacy had political ties as well. And it, it's interesting that you have – it's interesting when you look at different killers because you have the ones that are really, really good at integrating into society and can often get into, you know, certain modicums of, you know uh, – they can get to a certain level, you know, mm -hmm. before people start thinking, eh, that guy's kind of weird. Uh, but other ones – are so like off the rails that they could ne like everybody knows that dude is really weird, man. There's something wrong with that guy. Uh, but when you're talking about a Bundy or a Gacy, they had that charisma where they could get into places that other people couldn't get into. You know, uh, of course, Gacy was, um, was with the, Oh, why can't I think of which president's wife it was? Uh, uh, Rosalind oh, Carter, Jimmy Carter's wife. Yeah, it was Rosalind Carter. Yeah. yeah Jimmy Carter. That's who I was. Yeah. I mean, he's got those pictures. He was at the dinner with, with Rosalind. And then you have Bundy who was part of the Republican, yeah. uh, like convention helping, uh, to do all kinds of, uh, you know, um, 
He was a driver for all, somebody. Yeah. All kinds of. Yeah. Yeah, he did all kinds of stuff. Uh, he was ca- helping campaign for one of the Republicans yeah. there. So, you know, he was out there talking to people all the time. And, and you have to wonder if a lot of those people that are that already have some innate charisma, if they didn't use a lot of those things to craft themselves, right, and, and to go out there and to be respected, right? I met a guy this last weekend, and, and this is a crazy story. I, I told EJ this the other day. Uh, I was in Jacksonville, Florida for a show, uh, World Oddities Expo. I was doing a convention there, and a guy came up to me, and he saw the card game on the table. And one of the people that I always have out is Bundy. And he saw Bundy, and he said, man, i got to tell you a story about this guy. And I said, okay. I was like, you got a story about Bundy. And I I hear stories all the time. And uh, he comes up, and he's like, I was at a gas station uh, in the late 70s. He was like, I was there at the gas station. This white van pulled up, and this guy got out. He was wearing a white button-down shirt and a tie. He said, that's why I didn't think anything of it. He asked me for directions on how to get back to I-10 uh, going west. So he, so he said, man, and a couple weeks later, I was watching the news and they caught Bundy. And he said, oh, my God, that was the guy. Same white van that they caught him in, right? Mm. So this guy gave directions. And I asked him, I said, I said, now the question is, did you give him good directions? And he got this real weird look on his face. And uh, it was obvious to me that it was shame, that he mm. felt ashamed that he did give him really good directions on how to get back to I-10. Because what we know from the whole Bundy thing is that he left Jacksonville after trying to abduct a girl there in Jacksonville and the brother stopping him. He got back in the van, and he drove west on I-10 to go back to Lake City, and that's where he abducted Kimberly Leach, his last victim. He takes her 40 miles northwest from Lake City and dumps the body there. He then drives on towards Tallahassee, where he's eventually caught, right, about a week later. This is the guy that gave those last directions to send him directly to his final victim. And I could tell that he felt upset about that. And I looked at him and I said, listen, Bundy was going to find his way no matter what. You didn't do it. And he immediately looked relieved because I think he just needed to hear that, that it wasn't his fault. Like Bundy. And and so when I mentioned that to EJ, she said when they were doing the, um, the calculations of Bundy's time from Denver to Florida, the one thing that they realized is that he was terrible with directions that he constantly had to stop or constantly kept getting turned around because he didn't, he was not very good at reading a map. So, you know, we're talking in the late seventies where, you know, you didn't have GPS, you know, you, you, if you didn't know how to read a map, the only thing that you could do is stop and ask for direction. Yeah. It was very difficult. Those uh, maps too. yeah. Yeah. So apparently that was something legitimately, that he struggled with. So the story that the guy was telling me uh, is probably absolutely accurate that Bundy stopped to ask him and he never thought one thing about it because Bundy was dressed up like a normal guy, uh, actually kind of an upper, uh, an upper class kind of guy. And he didn't think twice about giving him directions. This wild, wild stories. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I can relate to that. I, I ran into Mark David Chapman that weekend, you know, and uh, it's haunted me. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. It's haunted me. And another guy I ran into was Richard Biegenwald. I was in his mother's house where, uh, and, and as we were leaving, he made a joke. He was acting very erratic. He was really like a clownish type of guy. And uh, it was on Staten Island, his mother's house. And as we were leaving, he pointed to this area. It was like a walled in area of his front porch. And he goes, this is where we bury the bodies. <laughs> And nobody oh, thought, wow. we just thought he was just a weird, crazy guy. He was a weird, crazy guy, you know? No and one was, was they, burying bodies there. Yeah. No, I don't think they've ever checked either. Where that, uh, no one's ever dug there. And wow. Was, yeah, I know, I know, I know, crazy stuff. Uh, but it, it, you, you it know, haunts you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I grew up and, um, you know, I grew up right outside of Philly, like yeah. I mentioned. And my dad... Um, 
half of my family is all Italian. I am not Italian at all. I am half Filipino, a quarter Polish, and a quarter German. But a bunch of my family is all married in Italian. They all owned restaurants in the early 70s. Uh, all of them were fronts for the mob uh, there in the Philadelphia area. Uh, so we were pretty close to a lot of the mob figures in Philly. My dad was friends with Angelo Bruno. Actually had to sit down with him about three weeks before they blew his brains out. And so, you know, I've always been close to that end of it, which is why I'm excited about writing uh, the criminals volume of Beyond the Headlines, uh, because I'm going to go and talk about, you know, uh, John Gotti and, you know, Kuklinski and stuff like that. So we'll get into some of that. Uh, but my dad also met Manson in the early 60s before the murders. So I grew up with a story about that. And it's a funny story because my dad... Uh, they were not friends. Um, Manson, like, he met a couple of the girls uh, in a park, and they said, you know, uh, my dad said uh, he wanted to go and party. They said, hey, yeah, we, uh, we but we got to ask Jesus first. And so they take him to a park bench, and Manson comes out, and he's sitting there. He's playing his guitar, and uh, they go up, and they talk to him. I think he said one or two words to my dad, and uh, – like Manson told the girls not to talk to my dad, that he wasn't invited to the party. So my dad, they said, okay, well, we know where the party's going to be because they pointed over to where the party was. And so my dad and his buddy went back there that night to try to rob Manson of his drugs. So <laughs> well, uh, fortunately, maybe unfortunately, uh, the party, they couldn't find it. So they went back there. They were, like, listening at doors at the hotel and everything to find this party and couldn't find him. But my dad, the, the story was, is that he was going to try to rob Manson. And, of course, three or four years later, they're watching the news, and the the murders happen, and the Tate LaBianca murders. And my dad is watching it, and he says, oh, my God, that's the guy. That's the guy we met in the park. And so he calls his buddy up, uh, Harry, and he says, dude, turn on the news. And they're watching it together. And, uh, and for sure they were like that, that was him. <laughs> it, it really is an incredibly small world. You know, people say that all the time, but it really is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the other big ones here in the book? Uh, uh, uh so, Beyond so the we've headlines, got Dahmer. Crimes and Mr. Not Legends. Uh, yeah. So we've got Dahmer there and then we finish off the book with, uh, there's 10 of them. Uh, we finish off the book with Dennis Rader, uh, who was BTK. And that one is uh, is interesting. I was never, like, really into that case all that much. Um, however, Dennis is the only one that I talk to personally. Oh, really? So, I, yeah, I was at a show a is couple of years alive? ago. Yeah, he's still alive. Okay. Uh, he's, I think, he, I think he's 78 right now. Uh, so he's he's getting up there in age. Uh, I know that he just like broke his leg uh, a couple uh, a couple months ago, so he's been recovering from that. But um, but I was at a show a few years ago, and I was I ended up on on a panel, and uh, it was funny because the show before that, uh, you know, I'm going and I'm I'm literally just the guy that created the the card game, right? Yeah. And I go there, and uh, my buddy. Uh, who's now a good friend of mine, John Borowski, who has done all of the big, like, serial killer documentaries and stuff. And I've known his work forever. Uh, he just released his Gacy documentary that uh, I think it comes out at the end of August. Uh, but anyway, uh, John was at an event with me. And just before that, I hadn't met him yet, but he had purchased a copy of Killers the Card Game. And so I thought it was on my Kickstarter then and he got he backed the kickstarter and i thought uh it was the same week that my printer said that they weren't going to print the cards and i was freaking out because i was like oh my god i don't know how i'm going to fulfill these cards i don't know what i'm going to do i don't have a printer they're not willing to work with me so the very first set that we put out uh were all hand done uh, i did them by hand i bought like a 900 hundred dollar printer and uh printed them out myself cut them glued them enameled them and shipped them out to people so that first set is uh, is one day it'll be actually pretty valuable. It's like got like a signature card and everything with it. But uh, but when John did that, I thought, Lord, 
uh, he's pretty famous in the true crime community. And I was like, man, if, I, if he posts that on his social media and I get 100 orders tomorrow, I'm never going to fulfill them. So I shut off all my marketing. <laughs> uh, and then a couple weeks later, we met each other at, at this uh, Dark History Con. Uh, yeah, it's Dark History and Horror Con uh, out in Champaign, Illinois. And we're out there together. And he's got this, uh, this talk on serial killer culture. And I go up there and he's like, Jeff, I'm getting ready to go do the talk. He was like, are you coming? And I said, I, I said, I, I mean, I'll go in there and sit in and watch. And he's like, he was like, well, why aren't you on the panel? And I said, cause nobody asked me. And he was like, well, I'm asking you come on here and get on the panel. I'm like, all right. So I go in there and I sit down and I'm in the middle and there's three of us on the panel. It's John Borowski, myself, and Steve Giannangelo. Uh, and if you know who Steve is, uh, he literally wrote the book on the psychology of the serial murderer. The guy is incredible. He's a professor. Uh, he's a former uh, former police detective, too, uh, and professor, uh, I think, at University of Illinois. Uh, but just an amazing guy. But I'm sitting between these two guys, and I'm thinking – what in the world am I doing up here? Uh, I literally created a card game. And uh, there's vi there's video of me sitting up there, and I'm wearing my, my, my top hat that's got skin on it. I'm wearing a skin hat and a serial killer vest. And I'm sitting up here on this stage between these two, like, giants in the true crime community. And I'm like, what is happening right now? Uh, what they didn't know is I have a lot of public speaking experience. So I have a background in this. So we ended up running the talk, and they're like, dude, you're welcome anytime. And so the next show that we went to, uh, I ended up on the panel with them, and there was like five of us. Uh, one of them was Ashley Keto, who is basically uh, when BTK went to prison and all of his family uh, didn't want anything to have, didn't want anything to do with him anymore. They had all uh, gotten rid of him. Uh, this one girl connected with him and would go and see him every week, every visitation, uh, there in Kansas. And she would go to the prison and see him. And she has kept in contact with him all these years and become really, really close with him. Like literally she has his will. So when he dies, she has to spread his ashes. Right. And so, uh, when we were on the stage together, uh, she also is really good friends with a lot of different killers. Uh, Elmer Wayne Henley being one of them who uh, was one of the accomplices of Dean Coral uh, and consequently shot and killed Dean Coral and is still in prison. But right at the end of our talk, Elmer uh, Wayne uh, Henley calls. And so we're all standing up there talking to Wayne Henley on the phone and uh, then me and her got to be pretty friendly, and she ended up introducing me to Dennis. And so when I decided to start writing the book, I asked him for his opinion and what he sh thought that I should cover in the book about him, since he was one of the few, or actually, I think the only person in the book that I covered that is still alive. I wanted to get his input on what he thought I should cover and to give some insight into himself. And so he gave me a few things, but the big thing that he wanted me to cover, and it's the legend that I talk about in the book, is whether Dennis was the Zodiac or not. So there has always been some speculation. Matter of fact, he's been questioned at least three times on his connection with the Zodiac killer. And there is a book that was written uh, that purports that he was the Zodiac. And uh, Dennis kind of laughs about it and uh, thinks it's kind of funny, but um, it's pretty easy to disprove that he wasn't the Zodiac. Uh, but there is some, some interesting evidence, the fact that he likes to talk to the police, that he likes to send different things, that he did uh, some ciphers early on. So there's a little bit of connection there, but I think it's more that he was paying attention uh, to the Zodiac murders rather than – because we also know that Dennis um, – really emulated a lot of different serial killers and was kind of following them, trying to be better than them. Uh, his favorite, which ironic, uh, this was not done on purpose. The publisher uh, created the cover for my book. And uh, when they came up with it, uh, Dennis is right next to H.H. H. Holmes. 
uh, I sent him the cover of the book uh, so he could see that he was on the cover. He loved it, and he loved the fact that he was next to his idol, which is H.H. H. Holmes. So he is literally right next to him on the cover of the book. He was... Uh, did you ever you ask know, Dennis him is pretty... about those uh, bondage photos? You know, he has these photos where he's buried up to his neck, where he's all tied up. Who took those pictures? Uh, this business yeah. about a timer. I don't buy that. So uh, he said he says that it was a timer. That yeah, he set it up that way. How do you unbury uh, yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, it, it it's wild. He's sticking uh, to that, huh? You know, Dennis was certainly into, into some very, very strange fetishes and things. And, you know, I did a he, – he has also seen this. I, I do some uh, very irreverent artwork, and I do these prints. And I was at a antique store, and I saw this old ad. It says uh, – I don't even know what the ad is for. It was in a magazine or something. But it, was, it says at the top, it says, Two Little Playmates – and it's got these two kids standing there holding hands, a boy and a girl. And it's a it's a painting. And so uh, I thought it was hilarious. So I have a very dark sense of humor. So I took out the faces and uh, I did a whole series of prints of different killers in the two little playmates faces. And one of them was Dennis and Dennis. So I have Dennis's face plastered on one, and the other one is Dennis in drag, uh, wearing his bondage clothes in the other with his mask on. And I sent that to him, and he loved it. Right? He, I mean, of course, Dennis is pretty narcissistic. Yeah. Uh, that's obvious. And so he thought it was hilarious. And so, yeah, he did. You ever get a chance he, to talk to that, that the son who who's. Uh, his family or his father was killed by BTK and he did his documentary about it. Oh, I've, I've watched that. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever track him down and talk to him? Uh, I have not. Okay. You know, I, it's been interesting, you know, being at, at different conventions and stuff, uh, being out in the public and the people that I meet, I have met so many people that are connected with some of these crimes. I've met some of the families out there. Uh, and it's been really surprising to me because, you know, we, we live in this world right now where there's a lot of polarization everywhere. Uh, and there are people on either side of the fence, people that get very angry about things. And, and I've experienced it once or twice, not, not nearly as much as I expected to. Uh, because when I came out with Killers, the card game, I really thought that people were going to come and, like, picket my table and, like, get me thrown out of places uh, because they were upset at the content, right? Uh, and what I've experienced is exactly the opposite of that. I've had one or two. Uh, I actually had a lady in uh, when I was in Kansas City that came up and, like, yelled at me. Uh, it was the first time that I had ever experienced that personally, and uh, she did not want to have a conversation. She was also a little drunk at the time, uh, but she was not happy about it. Uh, but at the same time, I've met, like, family members of Sylvia Likens. Uh, uh, oh, what is her name? I can't remember her first name. Uh, Gertrude Banachewski, right? She ended up torturing and killing Sylvia Likens after she was babysitting her uh, with her own two kids, I believe. Uh, they did all kinds of horrible stuff to that girl. And so uh, I ended up meeting one of the family members of that. Uh, Gertrude Banachewski is in the game. And so they saw that, and we had a long conversation about all of that stuff. Uh, her husband was one of the, the police officers uh, that works at the police department that investigated the crime. Uh, they actually have a monument out back uh, to Sylvia and the family. And it was amazing getting to talk to them and to meet them. Uh, I've met uh, Anthony Sears' cousin, who uh, is one of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims. And uh, I met her and her husband and her family at a show, and uh, they were incredible. She loved it, uh, loved the game, and uh, even wrote a paper about her uh, when she was in school. There was a paper that they had to write about the most influential people in history, and she did it on Jeffrey Dahmer because of the impact that he had on her own family. And so it was fascinating to stand there and talk to her. Uh, I mentioned the guy who uh, that met Bundy. But there's been all kinds of people. I had a lady that came up one time, 
And I really thought that this was going to be the end of like my business. Uh, but she came up and she asked me if uh, Anthony Sewell was in the game. He's the Cleveland Strangler. Uh, he actually killed 11 women up there in Cleveland and he buried them like in his walls and in his floor and outside of the house. He lived next to a sausage factory there. Oh, and so she came up and asked me if he was in the game. I said, yeah. And I flipped to him. I pointed at him and she taps his picture and she looks at me and she says, I just got to tell you, uh, Anthony killed my best friend. When you watch the documentary and they find the head in the bucket, that was my best friend's head. It's all they ever found of her. And when she said that, I stood there and I thought to myself, what do I say now? Yeah, that, I that thought, I, get, I, I need to pack up my booth, I think. I think we're done. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you, because you have uh, a very thought, lighthearted attitude about this, but have you experienced any kind of trauma or PTSD from – because I, I certainly do from talking to these people. I, I get very uh, affected by it. So I'll finish the story, and then I'll, then I'll explain that. And th th I've got a funny antidote about that. So the lady, she looks at me, and I'm standing there, and I'm horrified. I'm mortified at this point, like, oh, my God, what is going to happen now? She looks at me, and she's like – Oh my God, I think this is so great. She bought a copy of the game and she loves it. Uh, it was astonishing to me that that would be the response. Now, of course, that's not the response from everybody, uh, but somebody so directly affected by that uh, would think that. Now, so you asked me about how it affects me. It's funny because uh, I always believed, and maybe it's my own narcissism, uh, maybe my own my own problem, uh, but it really doesn't affect me all that much. Uh, but there was one time, and this is so crazy to me. Uh, I had a friend of mine who is a who is a uh, psychologist, a good friend of mine. She was posting on Facebook and everything right about the time that Netflix released Dahmer, and I guess she was watching it. And she kept posting on her Facebook page, you know, if you watch this, you need to, you may need to talk to somebody, blah, blah, blah. You know, this is a really intense show. And so I messaged her privately and I said, that's BS. Uh, I don't feel that way. It doesn't affect me at all. I could watch this stuff day in and day out. It doesn't bother me even a little bit. Right. And then I got to episode six. And the, the story of, uh, that's taken from the perspective of the victim. Uh, that, and, and, of course, you know, not really speaking to the accuracies or inaccuracies of the show, because there were many. Yeah. But watching that episode really, really messed me up. I watched it, and I really struggled with it. Uh, and maybe some of it is because, you know, we're talking about Jeffrey Dahmer. My name is also Jeff. Uh, there is a scene in there where he sits down and shows him a game that he's created and uh, they play this game. And I don't know why, like it was like one of those moments in my life where it was speaking directly to me. And I was like, Oh no. And uh, you know, knowing what happens to this gentleman and what Dahmer does to him, uh, I was like, I had to turn it off and I spent about the next three hours bawling my eyes out like really, really struggling internally. Uh, and then I immediately messaged her and I said, I said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. You were right. I think I need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so as much as I say that, uh, that it doesn't affect me, it does. It does. And, and it, and it always does. Right. There, there are certain things that are very difficult. Uh, but one of the reasons why I come from, come to it, the perspective that I do is that I think that it is important to tell the stories. I think it is a mistake that our culture makes when we want to bury all this stuff and we don't want to look at it uh, because it's difficult. Uh, and I think that because it's challenging, we need to look at it. We need to understand it. We cannot look away. If we ever have any hope of stopping some of this stuff, if we ever have any hope of you know helping people to not become monsters like that we have to look at it we have to understand it for what it is 
And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've created is very focused on that, right? The book is very focused on that. I want people to take a more critical eye when they're looking at this stuff and not just believing what any documentary says or what any book says. Really dive into it and understand it for yourself. Like, look at the evidence. Does it fit? Uh, Does it make sense? You know, it is a huge mistake that people just listen to these podcasts and stuff and they get one person's opinion. That's great. It doesn't mean they have all the information. There's so much crap out there. It's unbelievable. Uh, But Jeff Ignatowski, we are out of time. As a matter of fact, we're over time. I'm going to have to cut some commercials out. I'm going to send you a bill. Jeff Ignatowski, the book is called (laughs) Beyond the Headlines, True Crimes, Myths, and Legends. Uh, Also, you can get the game, which is a... Killers, the card games, 18 plus for lovers of all things true crime. Go to Twitter. Go to Twitter. Look up Jeff Ignatowski. Just spoke just like Taxi. You can find it. There's a link tree on there with all of his YouTube channels, TikTok. This guy's got a ton of content. Jeff, I hope we have you back. You can meet him in person. Lions Absolutely. Tooth. Yeah, Lions Tooth, Friday, October 11th at 5.30 p.m. Don't turn your back on him, though. I'm a little worried about this guy. <laughs> you're talking about you're dealing with Jeff <laughs> Dignitasi. He goes a little too deep into this stuff. Oh, just kidding, Jeff. But uh, come back, please. This is Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3 are going to be about the cults and religion and uh, criminals, too, as well. Jeff Ignatowski, thank you so much. Good thank night. you. <laughs> okay, good night.